Ben Robinson and Jim Schubach. Thank you very much, and please uh, join me in welcoming the guests. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Siddhant Daibu to come up and introduce new members. So we have seven new members that joined the Ottawa Valley chapter since our last meeting. Jordan Jibrissim, Omar Dai, Lokesh Ekin Kappa, Colin Cameron, Ashley Warren, Graham Holmes, and Ahmed Abdul Hadam. The theme for the evening is uh, research promotion. Uh, we're nearing the end of the research promotion campaign. Uh, if you haven't had a phone call, you'll be getting one shortly, but I'll ask Abby to come up, our RP chair, and speak about research. George did half my job, but uh, since tonight's theme is research, I just wanted to share uh, five fun and interesting facts about Ashway Research. So the Ashway Research Program was established in 1912. It supports 140 research projects with a combined value of more than $15 million. Research focuses include energy and resource efficiency, indoor environmental air quality, design and operation and management tools, alternative technologies, materials, and equipment, and through scholarships, grants, and awards, the Society supports engineering education for undergraduate students, research projects for graduate engineering students, and postdoctoral postdoctoral scholars. The RP campaign raises over $2.2 million from over 6,000 6, donors annually. Donors are made up of members, industry associations, and industry organizations. 100% uh, of the money raised for ASHRAE, ASHRAE research in Canada gets reinvested in Canadian research projects. Society has a bunch of strange acronyms to identify donors. These include LIBUNTS and CYBUNTS. And currently, we are 70% of the way to our 2015 and 2016 RP goal of $27,000, which is way ahead of Toronto, Montreal, and Quebec. Yes. So, great job. Uh, as George mentioned, the campaign is coming uh, to an end fairly quickly, along with our ASHRAE research campaign for this year. And I'd like to thank everyone, individuals and organizations that have donated already to support research. And I'd also like to extend a quick thanks to my committee, uh, Bob Kirkpatrick, George Mamari, Mike Swain, and Steve Moons for helping make it happen. And lastly, I'd encourage anyone who hasn't made a donation to please do so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next I will ask uh, Steve Moons to come up and speak about the golf tournament. There he is. Thanks, George. Um, so, uh, Andrew Duma with OHBC in my office is the one who is running the tournament again this year. He wasn't able to be here tonight, but he asked me to just update you all on where things are sitting. So, the tournament is scheduled for June 21st at the Marshes Golf Club, the same place we've been for the last couple of years. Um, you should have gotten information in the last communique, and anybody who has registered in the years or from last year should have also gotten a direct reminder. So, right now we're still in the holding pattern until the people who had foursomes confirm or deny if they want some. But you can get on the waiting list, and usually there's a couple of teams where the turnover. So, we're going to wait until the first of May for the returning foursomes to have the opportunity to rebook, and after that we'll start working our way down the. Um, uh, the replacement list. So if you want to get in on that, then give Andrew a call at our office or click on the communicate. Um, other than that, there is sponsorship opportunities available. And it's a great way to help, help the, the local chapter, local, cha local chapter. You get industry specific um, representation for the people who are going to be out at the event. And it's a really big help for us to raise money for our ASHRAE research. So uh, different opportunities for whole sponsorship, uh, for different competition sponsorships within the event. So give Andrew a call at our office or like say click on the link you'll find in the communique and find out all about it. Thanks very much. All right. Um, Next, I would like to ask Bob Kilpatrick to come up and speak about nominations. Thank you, George. Uh, so, 
As uh, chair of the nominating committee for our chapter, I am pleased tonight to announce uh, the proposed slate of the executive and uh, the board of governors that will uh, lead our chapter for the upcoming uh, year into 16-17. Uh, so, for um, the executive, we have as president Abby Saunders, president elect is Adam Graham, the treasurer is Dan Redmond, and taking the secretary position is Chris Butch, who I guess is not here tonight. And of course, uh, we can't forget our past president, George Mamari. On the board of governors, we have a proposed uh, board of Richard Cameron returning, Aaron Dobson returning, Chris Frawley returning, Adam Moons returning, and new to the board, I'm pleased to uh, announce, Adrian Matan. So, at this point, before we close nominations, I would just like to ask if there are any final nominations that might come from the floor. And if there are none, I would ask uh, that someone could make a motion to close nominations for this year. That's Mike. Thank you very much, Mike. Could I get a seconder, please? <coughs> from Phil? Paul. Paul, sorry. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks very much, everyone. And um, so I'd just like to say thank you to uh, all of those who have agreed to take on the uh, leadership role for next year. And uh, with that, the installation of the executive and the board will take place at uh, next month's meeting, which I believe is May 17th. And uh, I hope to see all of you there. It's uh, always a special night with past presidents and spouses and all kinds of things. So uh, make sure that you're here next month. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, before we start dinner, I guess we're starting dinner. So, but we've got uh, a couple tabletops uh, today. I'd like to ask someone from HTS to come up and talk about the tabletop. That. Hello everyone, um, I guess I'd like to take this opportunity to just introduce you to our tabletop which you may or may not have seen. Um, it's for Omega heat pumps and uh, it's a line of vertical stack heat pumps um, both with or without HRV or ERV. Um, so if you have the opportunity feel free to stop by and answer any questions or anyone from the office. Please. Thank you. Uh, Hi, I'm Clark Campbell from Limo. I'm the district sales manager who looks after Ottawa. And I apologize, don't wear insurance tonight. <laughs> you will stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, tonight I'm presenting our new zone valve. So it's replacing the conventional zone valves that are in the industry with the paddle design. Uh, we've gone with the ball valve design. Uh, the CDs and flows are set by changing the travel stop, so it's really easy to adjust to the field. And we offer a full range of on-off and modulated control valves. Thank you very much. Stop by later if you need any more information. Thank you. And last, uh, E.H. Price. To get someone up to talk about their table <coughs> Uh, I'm Rick from E.H. Price. Uh, we have a uh, duct socks fabric dumps. It, uh It's great for any uh, high humidity applications or any rust. You can wear them. Uh, great for gyms, airports, and you need high flows. Uh, we also have a, a lab diffuser. It's a fabric diffuser. It's great for uh, low phase velocity. So. Uh, we have brochures. If you have any questions, free to stop by and ask us. Thanks. Okay. Uh, before we break for dinner, uh, one last thing. Uh, we've got some uh, raffle tickets for two games uh, for the Red Blacks. The home opener on July 8th. Don't even buy dinner. That's a two. No, sorry. Oh, sorry. Two tickets, not two games. Two tickets. Uh, donated by in air. Uh, Abby will be going around if you haven't bought your tickets. Uh, all the proceeds go towards uh, Asher Research, and I'd like to thank in air, which 
they uh, are not here right now, but I'd like to thank them for their donation. It really goes a long way for our campaign. So enjoy your dinner, and uh, we'll see you uh, in about an hour with our program talking with uh, Chris Powell. Thanks. Uh, 
So really we're talking about a discussion about uh, high-rise design practices in tall buildings. Draw upon our experiences in the Middle East and in Toronto. Many, there are many factors indeed. Do I do need this? Can you guys hear me if I just talk like this? Yeah. Are you all right with that? Yeah. I don't know where to stick this sometimes. Right here or wherever. Um, yeah. Um, I'm always willing to accept, you know, some, someone who has experience in those things. I could always interrupt as well. So. Very good. Um, yeah, so it, lots of things that influence design choices, and we'll get into a bit of that. Um, and really we're talking about high-rise residential uh, uh, hospitality commercial facilities. <coughs> so uh, I kind of threw this in here from uh, past life, basically Toronto, the climate, all that good stuff. Everyone knows what that's like. Um, Dubai is really quite different. Um, and this is a picture of the Dubai skyline on a not all that low hanging cloudy day. So you see a fair number of buildings that poke themselves through the uh, through that uh, layer. This is our Shangri-La Towers, uh, which was a hotel and service department that we did. And then, of course, the Emirates Towers, which is kind of the, the Sheikh's uh, um, home turf. So. Uh, a discussion or a way to look at this could be the, the why, the, the what, the how, and well, because, it's just because. So uh, why, well, for safety, for health, for fit for purpose, the thinking that has to go in for economic viability, and, and, and these things can be different in different places. Uh, the economics of buildings in Dubai can be quite different from the, the, very, the, like the Wild West kind of Dubai is very different from the very sharp developer thinking that that uh, permeates the market, let's say, in Toronto. But, you know, and of course, effectiveness, energy efficiency, all these things come into play. And the what is really just the physics of moving air and water through a building in order to achieve something or other, which is basically things like um, that are affected by climate, by, by the shape, um, the international standards and local regulations, uh, investor, developer, financial expectations, again, they, they, they very much drive the kinds of thinking that goes into uh, choosing systems and what will fly in one place won't really go very well in another. Uh, and, of course, long-term, short-term thinking, which we, I'm afraid we all know about. Market forces clearly uh, is a driver of system choice, what kind of, what vendors have available in the market. Uh, labor costs versus material costs are, are a key driver for system choice. Uh, in a place like Dubai where labor is relatively cheap but equipment is expensive, um, you, you see things that are more labor intensive to install but are cheaper to buy, uh, sorry, or um, maybe a bit cheaper to buy in the first place. So a fan coil unit, horizontal fan coil unit is a system of choice there, for example, uh, whereas for us, any kind of a high rise, uh, typically we're going to see vertical fan coils where there's a lot less labor involved. Uh, and contractor habits and capabilities come into play, as we all know in our, in our business anywhere, uh, it's, it's hard to sometimes change people's mindsets. Um, Maintenance likelihood, clearly, uh, if systems are never going to be maintained, then that is uh, something that should be considered in the design. As these markets mature, as Dubai has matured, things are getting better in that regard. But um, certainly in the early, in my first tour there in the 80s, uh, that was a, a prime consideration for anything that was going to happen. Um, and clearly regional habit, um, and then the types of ownership uh, also influence that and because they drive long-term versus short-term thinking. Uh, the engineer's position in the market is also a consideration. Um, we won't go too far into that. 
So a little bit of physics, uh, if we're going to be talking about high buildings, a column of water in a single story building exerts some pressure, um, assuming that you have a, a single story of that particular height. So imagine then that if we have 10 of those, that's 10 times. And it's a very simple multiplication that would work great if I push the right button. That a 30-story building exerted um, uh, 10 bars, and now we're up to 30 bars in a 90-story building and at 435 PSI. In any uh, system or unit you want to think about, that's a lot of pressure. So, um, Hmm? Sorry. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how do you eat an elephant? Right? One bite at a time really is, I guess that could be the theme of my talk today, is eating the elephant one bite at a time. Um, because you can talk about a tall building as a collection of shorter buildings. And, and you sort of have to think about it that way. Uh, clearly there's an infrastructure that we will talk about, but individually within zones of the building, whether they're functional or they're technical zones, uh, you think about them as a, as a building, that, a segment of the building that you can manage. So pack three 30-story buildings on top of each other and you've got a 90-story building. Take three 10-story buildings and you've got your 30-story building. So you've got nine 10 story buildings in a 90 story building. So clearly then that the interface pressure with occupants becomes an issue. Uh, material pressure limits deciding on where these, is it 10 stories? I don't know, a 10, 12, 9, 8, 15. It can depend on what we're talking about, whether they are um, systems that, that have to be closely regulated to a smaller pressure like domestic water or systems that can have a wider pressure variation like uh, closed circuit uh, loops like cooling and heating. But clearly though, um, we can separate a larger building into smaller chunks and we have an infrastructure that can handle the, the more rigorous requirements of of the overall building. So we're moving water and waste and other fluids up and down the vertical axis. Um, water can move orders of magnitude greater energy than air can. So as a general system of choice, you want to be moving water uh, for cooling or um, rather than, than air, although clearly at some point you have to transition to uh, uh, to, to cool the air of a building, and the issue is going to be at what point do you do that. So less shaft space is a good thing in a tall building. <clears throat> High pressure zones, um, uh, again, create this backbone uh, between the, the, the segments of the building that we can, we can deal with. As we move beyond the limits of, of, the, of the equipment that we want to be dealing with, um, we put in pressure breaks. In a closed system, uh, the heat, heat exchanger is the typical pressure break that we would have. And um, the place where that pressure break occurs is really dependent upon the economics of providing high pressure systems? Uh, is, it more, is it cheaper to buy very, very expensive piping or very expensive uh, infrastructure? Or is it cheaper or is it more, is it, is it available to you to have mechanical rooms more often in the building and, and switch over to a, a lower pressure regime? Uh, clearly, you have to have specialized training to work on these very high pressure systems. Uh, so but it all becomes a balancing act between the functionality of the building, where you get your mechanical rooms, and uh, at a certain point, we all have our masters. So it's not all about HVAC, it's about the building, and that has to function 
in the way that's in, intended. So if you have to have a very high pressure system at some point, then so be it. You just have to have the proper safeguards in design. So a closed circuit um, system uh, is typically um, uh, cascaded through a heat exchanger, but as you can see, in a chilled water system, for example, you're going to start losing effectiveness as you start going into secondary and tertiary systems. You can't get it as cold as it used to was, so there you go. Um, in domestic systems, you, or in fire protection type systems, you actually have an open tank, uh, which is a reservoir up in the building somewhere, and uh, you have a pumping system that would take it the rest of the way or ensure that even at, if, for example, the tank is at the top of the building, the pump would, would ensure that the floors just below the tank have sufficient pressure and the rest is hyperstatic. But we'll talk a little bit more about those things and they actually can serve um, dual purpose. The, the tank um, in a slender building at the top can become a very important component of the structure because it's a dampener for uh, the, the wind effect that can literally move a building a meter either way and can be rather disconcerting to someone in a very high-end apartment when you know his coffee is sloshing. Um, can't be a good thing. But a large tank of water serves as a dampener because the inertia of the water, as the building and the tank moves, the water didn't move. And so you get that dampening of, of the oscillation, and that's a good thing. So there you go. Cooperation between disciplines. So the uh, tall building um, association, uh, CTBUH, acronym I don't actually recall for the moment, uh, has defined buildings. Uh, tall buildings, anything above 150 meters is tall. Uh, anything above 300 is super tall, above uh, 600 is mega tall, and above, well, they're getting to a kilometer nowadays. We're thinking about it anyway, and I think that's just an elevator to the, to, uh, to the space station. Um, but I think what's really interesting in this is that the progression between what used to be just office space into tall buildings, nowadays is morphing into something quite different, uh, either office or high-rise residential, but mixed use really is, is, a, is a primary um, element to thinking about tall buildings. And that drives certain challenges, and it's, it's interesting that I mean, for the poorest, for example, um, we've got the hotel in the base, and this is the hotel functions where you have large conference rooms in the base, of course, this is tapering up, and you've got lots of room in the bottom, so you've got big conference facilities down there, and then you've got residences, and then you've got uh, Sky Lobby and more residential, and then you've got office suites, and you've got public spaces, so the restaurants are up there, the Sky Lobbies, um, uh, lookouts, all kinds of things coexisting within this building and many of them having very different requirements and so I mean, clearly you can see that there's a number of mechanical levels uh, and you'll see that uh, that kind of thinking going on in other uh, examples that I'll show you as well. Where is this building, where is that located, sorry? That building Dubai. is in Dubai. Dubai. Um, at the time it was the world's tallest building it was called the Moors Dubai until Dubai ran out of money. Is <laughs> stock exchange like the exchange? No, Moors Burj, Burj means mountain, or, I believe, in Arabic. And um, so it was the Burj Dubai, but then Dubai ran out of money and Abu Dhabi bailed them out. And the crown prince of, of Abu Dhabi is Khalifa. So um, it was the saddest. Uh, announcement by the, the, the Sheikh of Dubai when he announced the opening of the Burj Khalifa as opposed to the Burj Dubai. Uh, we watched it on TV. I happened to be there at the time. And um, anyway, uh, there you go. It's the Khalifa. I like the Khaleesi, which is Game of Thrones, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so point towers have a lot going on. And I just wanted to just touch base a little bit about the, the floor plan and interdisciplinary issues. Uh, it's not just mechanical that's got to get along. You know, we've got electrical distribution going up and down, communications, we've got servicing operations, we've got maids and waste collection, and um, possibly we've got multiple addresses. So you could have um, the, this level being the entrance way to the hotel at the ground, the residential at the sky lobby. So all this has to kind of coexist. We've probably got a parking entrance at grade, um, multiple elevator banks, and some of these are low rise elevators, some of them are high rise, some of them pick up from other places. And then, of course, you've got to have some retail. So you've got to deal with all these things uh, and coexisting on the ground floor. We tend to get um, minimum space here. But in a center core type building, um, you can see the elevator banks. You can see low rise elevators, the high rise elevators. Here, of course, we have our good old mechanical room squeezed between two shear walls. How many of you have experienced that wonderful thing? Squeezed between two shear walls. Um, then you need to fight for ceiling space to make sure that you can get out of and into that that floor by floor mechanical room with any degree of, uh, of grace. Otherwise, there's going to be problems. But as you go up that building, the floor plate may change, but so does the, the, the core. And that core, will start, you'll start to shed elevator shafts because you've already gone through the low rise, you leave those guys away, the next two floors, maybe you've got the elevator machine room to deal with, but then that gets knocked away. You still have, in this particular case, you still have your floor by floor um, air handling units. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan personally, um, although not every building is conducive to that. In this scheme, you have a lot of flexibility for uh, change in, um, in office type uses. But as we're going up, uh, we start to shed core as well. The core becomes smaller, likely the floor plate becomes smaller too. And until we reach a, a, a peak where the, the hat on top of the lady uh, tends to become a big decorative feature. This is a central core type approach. Uh, there are other ways to deal with it. Um, ex two external cores. Uh, this is the index building by Foster in, um, in Dubai. The cores are on either side. Uh, the National Bank of Dubai was our first project in, in Dubai, and it has the cores on either side as well. So the good part about that is your floor plate is completely wide open. There's nothing there in your way, oh, uh, except for uh, lateral bracing that has to happen occasionally, uh, because the structural guys are going to want to do that. Otherwise, you got two posts holding up your building and anything pushing on it, there's nothing to resist that, and that could be a bad thing. So um, you wind up with these things cutting across the, the building uh, at various intervals. Um, one could say that's a nasty thing, it's an excellent thing for us, because we get to put our um, mechanical rooms where the, that cross bracing occurs. And um, it's great mechanical space as long as you can deep around a little bit of structure. It's really nasty space to try to rent. So they're usually happy to give it to us. Um, this is the Emirates Towers, uh, a building that we, we did in the early 90s. Uh, we'll probably come back to this a little bit later because it's an interesting example of very mixed use. There's a hotel, service departments, and um, office space. And we used to have our offices right about there. <clears throat> then we moved across the street because we got too expensive. Talking about coexisting, we have to live with Sparky as well. So power distribution is an interesting kind of composition in a big building, a big tall building. Um, and while we we typically imagine, uh, you know, 600 volts as being the, the number that we deal with. Uh, on, on buildings, although many chiller plants will go with much higher voltages, uh, particularly when they're, they're close to transfer, the transformer 
area and you can minimize uh, those kind of costs. Um, voltage drop issues become a real problem and we go with much higher voltages and we'll have actual transformer stations buried within the inside of these taller buildings uh, in order to transform down to operational voltages. So that's a, a, you know, an element that we have to consider and, um, and, and live with and accommodate as mechanical engineers. So uh, enough of those guys, let's talk about our things. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about plumbing, because after all, why not? Uh, we'll talk a bit about life safety, talk a bit about HVAC systems, we'll throw in some envelope, and then we're going to throw a couple of flights of fantasy, actually one flight of fantasy at the very end of it all. So uh, water supply in Dubai is legacy of unreliability. Good luck if, uh, if your water always works. So uh, really what we have is um, water supply in <coughs> each building. And whether it's on the top of the building or, on, or in the basement, in, in a podium, uh, either way, you're going to have some level of, of storage in these facilities. Uh, this is whether or not NFP would require you to have it for fire protection at a higher level. This is just something that, uh, that is typically done. Um, in Toronto, of course, we're quite different. Uh, we rely on our municipal services. Uh, nonetheless, though, in a tall building, we would have to store fire water at the highest level. Uh, in Toronto, that was a mandate uh, because the fire chief was stomping his feet about that for many, many years, and he had the final say. He literally had um, projects redrawn for when it was topped off uh, structurally uh, if it didn't have a, a supply at the top of the building. Um, and even though it wasn't necessarily mandated by code at the time, he was the authority having jurisdiction, so there. Um, so pressure regulation for water and domestic water becomes an issue. Uh, clearly, every 30 stories of residential building is 10 bars of pressure. You don't really want 10 bar of pressure coming out your tap. Um, that would make a bidet rather... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it would, uh, yeah, it's a pressure washer kind of thing. It's just not a, not a good picture, uh, particularly after dinner. So pressure regulation is necessary. Um, we talked, or I showed a little thing about keeping the, these zones separate. If you have the luxury of mechanical space above and below these zones, you can do great things by changing the loop and doing all kinds of pressure reduction in spaces where you don't have to, you don't have to do a lot of it. You do it in one spot and you do lateral uh, distribution. Um, it doesn't often always work that way. In the Shangri-La Hotel, they didn't want to see mechanical rooms halfway through. I don't blame them. So we had to have um, a pressure reduction. Uh, come up long now. You can come up now. Aha. Right. Pressure reduction within the risers themselves. Um, that's a nasty operational issue, which I'm sure that there are maintenance guys who are probably cursing our name about now. Uh, you know, 15, 20 years later. Uh, but, you know, every single pipe has this pressure reduction uh, uh, valve in multiple places up and down this building in behind an access door somewhere. Another aspect to any kind of vertical distribution, and this kind of goes not just for plumbing, but any of these is um, expansion. And particularly in that part of the world, it's not just the operational temperatures you have to worry about. It's the temperature difference between when it was installed and when it's actually being used. So while your operational temperature difference is whatever, 40 to 70, it may have been installed when it was 130 degrees outside. So you've got to worry about that. And so we put in additional uh, expansion joints. And you toss them in like, um, like Smarties. Domestic hot water. Um, yeah, 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 all these things, right? We all know domestic hot water. You make it, you use it, gas, electric, solar, da da da. Or in the closet. Um, in the first place we lived in, it was an older place, 
and our, our water tank was on the roof like it typically is, and we had a little uh, hot water tank in our bathroom which was in a uh, air conditioned space. So we'd get hot water from that tank in the winter time and coolish water from what passes as winter for them from the, the regular tap. In the summertime you, you switch your thinking and you turn your hot water off and you get cold water from the hot water tank because that tank was in a cool environment and you get hot water from your cold water tank because it's coming off the roof and it's going to fry you. So just a little thought there, um, watch out which tap you open in what season, uh, otherwise you know you might singe that part that got pressure washed before. <laughs> um, an interesting uh, element to, um, to water distribution in a high-rise building, it doesn't have to be super tall, any kind of um, anything beyond a certain level, is that if you're creating separate hot water zone from a central hot water system, you cannot connect the recirculation system from the low pressure side to the high pressure side. If you follow this a little bit, I mean, I've seen this, a lot of uh, young engineers will just tack it right in and all, and you say, well, how exactly is that going to work? Well, I'll put a check valve in. Yeah, and it's never going to actually flow um, because you have high pressure on the one side and this little thing is just doing nothing. So rather than that, we would put a hot water tank in the low pressure side with its own little pump. But you got to watch out for that hot water tank. You put a small one in, which is usually all the room you get. That thing will burn out in a, in a year or two because it's turning off and on and on and off, off and on. And that's not a happy thing for anything. And pretty soon it gives up the ghost and somebody's knocking your door saying, look at this, it's burned out again. So. Um, the, the other way to do that is to provide a little brace heat exchanger between the, uh, the high pressure side and the research side and just let the, let the flows go as they do and size the heat exchanger for whatever uh, it's going to give you. Uh, moving on to the, to the result of you know, our dinner, uh, drainage and, and that kind of good stuff. Um, Toronto, clearly, we all know, it all flows downhill. Um, and uh, everyone knows how to do it because it's written down. <laughs> and it's great. Because it was written down, you know what to do. In Dubai, it's all over the place. You've got British standards, uh, which we term as BS standards. Um, North American, various international, this, that, the other. Um, however, they do require dual stacks. So you have gray water collection and you have soiled water collection. Um, they do this indirect thing where you go into a hopper. Anyway, it's not a not a particular. It's a British thing where you do all your gray water through a floor drain as opposed to directly into the stack. Uh, I'm not a fan. Um, one thing in a tall building you should be worried about. Going back to the this this whole theme of geysers um, is something called a hydraulic jump. Uh, when, when a uh, drain translates from vertical to horizontal, you have a pressure buildup that is, um, is within a certain number of diameters, I think it's about 10, uh, where if you make any kind of connection to that, you will create a, um, a high pressure zone that can flood a toilet, for example, uh, and cause flooding. So uh, in a system like this, for example, we would take the, the high pressure line and not connect it to the, to the lowest floor where we're connecting all the horizontals together and literally take hor a horizontal branch farther away and make the final connection down here somewhere because of that hydraulic jump and the issues that can come of that. Once again, we're, we're following the theme, right? We were, first we were pressure washing, then we were scalding, and now we were um, doing something else to the poor person on the, on the facilities. Uh, NFPA, we're going on to life safety things. Uh, really, we, uh, we have, again, it's written down. Dubai nowadays is, uh, is following uh, that uh, standard. 
typically. Um, now at 1 King Street West in Toronto, a project that I was a contractor on back in a previous life, um, we had fire storage tanks at the roof level and we just made it before the, there's a limit, something like 296 PSI lift that you can have before um, NFPA says no more. So the fire pumps in the basement, there are large turbine pumps reaching down into a, a collection uh, a tank system, we're able to lift it up into the, to the tanks on the roof level, which on this very slender building, if you've ever been and seen One King Street, it's, it was built on top of an old heritage building or in through a heritage building, very, very slender, and I'm sure that that tank is helping it in its, uh, in its vibrations. But something that's more apropos maybe to us is uh, smoke control. Uh, clearly high buildings uh, have issues in that regard, uh, areas of refuge, uh, uh, maintaining uh, smoke within certain regimes and, and making sure that the exit path is, uh, is clear. Uh, so we pressurize above and below the floor. Stairwell pressurization is, a, is an issue that we should all be clear about. Uh, the big ticket is to make sure that the door can open. So if you're trying to run out off the floor and the pressurization fan is stopping you from getting out the door, uh, that's a real problem. And, you know, all the strapping folks here in good health, it's one thing, but you get a little old lady who hasn't got that much uh, push to her, that can be a real problem. So uh, 133 newtons is the limit. and you. The big thing there is in a building, you cannot just supply air at the top and expect that the entire stair shaft is going to be pressurized equally. You've got pressure losses, just like you would have in a duct. And so you need to have a separate uh, distribution system that's going vertically and tying into the, 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 the stair every six or seven floors and supplying air into it at an even pressure so that you can regulate that, that door pressure. Um, elevator shaft pressurization as a requirement is a real problem. Uh, the codes today, uh, if, you, if you follow them explicitly, create a situation that you can't achieve. Uh, the fire uh, fighters, elevators, won't, doors won't close because you're blasting so much air through that place that um, that you just can't uh, deal with it all. So um, various authorities allow uh, alternative solutions where now we can put VFDs on, on these kind of uh, pressurization fans and crank them down to something a bit more normal. Um, otherwise, it's, uh, it doesn't work based on what the codes require. So uh, air conditioning uh, and HVAC and all those good things really it does boil down to looking at the building as a series of smaller buildings. And each of these segments then has to be evaluated based on all the things that we would do anyway. First cost, constructability, uh, energy, life expectancy, maintenance, all these things come into play in each one of these. And for various um, functionalities, there are systems that are preferred. You know, clearly, you don't put a central air, air handling unit in to handle a whole bunch of residential units, right? You do something that's more decentralized. Or uh, you have a choice. You can go floor by floor, or you can have mechanical rooms on a regular basis and provide ducts up and down. But it depends on how much uh, space you're prepared to give up for shafts, right? If you have a 20,000 square foot floor plate, after you've done five floors, you're at 100,000 CFM moving around. That's, uh, that's not a small shaft at that point. On the Emirates Towers, um, as I pointed out, where these cross bracings occur, we do have mechanical rooms. And in, in the uh, office tower, you can see that they're a little bit more regular. Uh, and each of these was upfed and downfed from central air handlers. That, uh, that supplied that. But in the hotels, we were talking about uh, uh, fresh air systems, 
so dedicated fresh air with uh, fan coil type systems that did the cooling for the spaces so the, the zone could be wider. So perimeter radiation, uh, da, 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 da. I mean the distribution systems that, that we can talk about for tall buildings are really the same as you would have for any other building. There are some there's good new stuff around. We can do radiant overhead heating and cooling these days. We can do chilled beams. Uh, all these things can be applicable to, to a tall building just like they would to a building with a larger floor plate and, and wider. Um, what is not so prevalent, as I had pointed out, I think, before, um, is that the vertical stacked heat pumps or vertical stacked units uh, are not actually used. And, of course, heat pumps in Dubai are not used at all because, well, why bother? Um, so, um, fresh air supply is, a, is an issue. Um, in Toronto, I guess we are more and more looking to have, uh, to have uh, heat wheel type heat exchange technologies in Dubai that's been mandated for quite a while um, because humidity control is an issue and uh, we need to do whatever we can to to dry make up air uh, supply so we do need to, um, to pressurize buildings um, the facade becomes an issue and we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit uh, particularly, once again, in an uh, unregulated environment like the Middle East. Kitchen exhausts in a tall building are, uh, are a challenge. Um, sometimes there are setbacks that allow give us uh, roof space. But I would suggest to you that it is, um, it, it's not a particularly um, happy uh, owner who wishes to see our kind of junk on a ceiling that is visible from everybody above the fourth floor, let's say, uh, in a building. So if you've got a building that's stepping back, everybody can look down on that on that roof, on that roof, and doesn't they don't really want to see all the kind of stuff that we would have. So having a, a miscellaneous kitchen exhaust fan around is not on. So we'll have grease extraction, some kind of a ecologizer type system, and uh, collect that together and take it out the side. Um, in a much less obtrusive place. Um, general building exhaust, um, residential kitchen exhausts, uh, for us, we have developers who have a very strong sense of what they want and poking a little uh, vent through the side of a building, it doesn't matter if it's 40 stories tall, they're going to insist that it happens that way. Um, in some other places, you don't have that option. If you have a full curtain wall, uh, you have nowhere to go out the side of a building. And you have to do a collection system for something like uh, kitchen smell. And um, in a place like the UAE where fried foods is a big deal, you certainly wouldn't want to be collecting that, that kind of um, uh, extraction in a duct system that's not made for it. Because you're going to get grease impacting there at a certain point anyway and that becomes a fire hazard and it's just not a good thing so um, really what you do is you provide I'm not sure how well this is going to show but you provide hoods that um, and you provide a collection system but you're expecting that between the time that you're pulling it away from the ceiling void or, or when it's being uh, generated by the stove to where you're pulling it away in the ceiling void you probably shed most of the grease in surfaces on the kitchen or kitchen ceiling or, or through the, the local hood um, filtration system. Similarly, uh, uh, washrooms for us, even in a tall building that is a residential type building, you're going to see uh, vents going out the side, um, dedicated um, demand control extraction is something that's really coming on in, in these taller buildings where, again, where the facade doesn't allow you to do that, and so you have systems that uh, could regulate uh, that extraction rate and keep it to a minimum as, uh, as possible. So um, 
in these tall buildings, uh, where do the chillers go? Where do the boilers go? Where does the emergency generator go? Dubai was really big on air-cooled chillers until we got new refrigerants, and now we can do water-cooled, because it is quite humid there. Uh, so water-cooling wasn't really possible. But uh, they do a lot of district cooling. So uh, 80,000 tons of cooling in a, in a building, and it, it is extended to serve a subdivision or a, a main drag of a, of, a, uh, of a larger street. Um, but you can see here that these point towers, you know, really, you've got to wonder um, where, you, where you could possibly put something like the chiller plant at all. So district cooling was the thing that, that uh, serves the Sheikh Zayed Road in some of the sections. Um, but they do have uh, a lot of developments, and any kind of development that's on a podium, for example, you can imagine a number of different places where you could put uh, the chiller as well as the cooling tower and whatever plant goes with that, uh, on, either on the podium, um, which is not impossible, or perhaps on the low-rise building that can still serve the, the high-rise buildings through uh, pressure breaks. Um, clearly, boilers want to be at the top of something. You don't want to be having stacks you know, in, a, in a place that's uh, that's going to be anywhere near uh, open windows as a minimum, but you don't want them anywhere near what really you imagine here would be a pretty high-end space. You want to have people out there enjoying it and not geeking around uh, exhaust fumes. So again, the low-rise building in this particular case is a good example of where one might put the, the entire plant. Uh, in a point tower, however, your options are limited. Uh, as the, When the point tower becomes very narrow, like these guys, very, very slender. You really have to have uh, an imagination as to where chillers could possibly go, and they're not going to go in the building. They'll go somewhere near it uh, with more land, or you're going to get uh, by chilled water or whatever you're going to need from a district system. Um, in the landmark building, which we did, uh, which we helped Cesar Pelli do in, um, in, in Abu Dhabi, uh, this is a tall building that. You may be able to see in behind that screen there's a secondary annulus and um, it's a mechanical space with the towers on top and the chillers underneath and they um, uh, they managed to get all that up there uh, lifting those chillers and towers up uh, 55 or so stories becomes a, a challenge in itself uh, so it's a logistics uh, problem that they overcame the, uh, the space around that mechanical room is, however, a, a recreational space. It's got a pool, uh, high-end lounge, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, personally, I'm not a fan. It's nasty up there. Uh, when you get up to, tall, uh, to the top of tall buildings, it's not as, I mean, you've got a great view, but the wind's always blowing, and it's not great, generally. So uh, when we talk about envelopes, uh, there's been a lot of development on, on that, and we're not going to delve too, too deeply into that, but clearly uh, I think a huge thing for us as mechanical engineers has been some of the high-performance glazing that's out there. And uh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, there are climates where a double skin can be accomplished. Um, I don't think too much for us here with our extremes in the winter and ice storms and those kinds of things, but uh, there are places where that's applicable and active shading as well. But uh, one thing you should be aware of, and back to the Burj as an example, is that there is an adiabatic rate. Uh, as you go up from the ground, uh, it gets colder. Anybody who's been in an airplane and you look, you see the screen, it says it's minus 50 degrees outside, or minus 60, well, that's a uh, living proof of it. It occurs, uh, even at this scale. So you can see that at the base of the, of the uh, Burj, in this particular instance, it was 85. At the top, it was 68.8. So this has implications on um, our loads. You can have heat transfer between the lower and the upper, upper voids. Uh, there's all kinds of opportunities and challenges that come from this. 
Um, as, a, as a direct consequence, however, of it being um, of it being a tall building, we have a major issue uh, typically uh, with regards to stack effect. And for us in the winter, stack effect is the big thing of air rushing in the bottom and out the top. In the summertime, in more extreme conditions, it's the reverse. So air comes at the top and rushes up the bottom. Um, and there's the envelope that is supposed to be so very good and have such uh, good tight qualities um, is an important aspect to make controlling that. But also things like uh, sealing up our mechanical areas, you know, closing off elevator shafts, the top of the elevator shaft, uh, all these things, building pressurization, all these things have to be considered in order to control that, that kind of a problem. Um, and of course, wind. And that kind of takes me to my next thing here. Um, we, we did the Atlantis uh, theme park in Dubai. It was a 1,200 room hotel with a water park, um, 25,000 tons of cooling to cool the hotel and the fish, because you don't want poached fish. Um, at least not when Johnny is looking at, at it in the aquarium and says, Mommy, how come the fish is swimming upside down? Um, but this is right on, at the, on, on the Gulf Coast, and there's a prevailing wind that comes in from the Gulf. So um, there is our wind coming in off the Gulf, and that wind um, gets collected by this funnel that the building is. So the, the building was built by a con contractor and client joint venture. So they kind of ran a little bit rough shot on us uh, when it came time for us to start stamping our feet about certain things. So in the Port Cochere, this is the main entrance facility to the entire hotel. And there's the big double doors on the other side, the other side of this picture. Um, the Port Cochere has a lovely glass uh, uh, statue in the middle, and it's got this big void space. So we, we said we have to sprinkle the void space, and they said, no, nope, we're not sprinkling the void space. And we said, you must, and they did. Um, and thankfully they did, because six months before opening, there was a fire in that void space, and the sprinklers went off and saved the day. And they were able to open on time which was a massive big deal um, because we were having people fly in from all over the place. It was a huge opening. What they did uh, follow our recommendation on was actually sealing the walls to the roof. Uh, why should we seal the walls to the roof? I mean, the rain falls straight down. It will shed off the roof. Who cares? Well, here's what happens when you collect all this air that's going that's on this entire facade and you push it through that one hole. You get Mr. Bernoulli showing up. And Bernoulli says, I'm sucking, not blowing. And that suckage showed up in the Port Cochere to the point where if a client in a Nabaya or a dish dash, which is a very flowy kind of female and men's rope, would come through the double doors Literally, it would be horizontal uh, <laughs> to the inside of the building. And they were wondering, how come we can't keep this place cool? It must be the contractor's fault, right, Ben? Always. Yeah. And so they got the contractor to try and do all kinds of things. And, uh, well, that didn't work. So they finally called us uh, and started yelling at us. And we said, well, we'll look at it. And this is what we came up with. By George, they should have sealed the edge. Um, the remediation is simple, seal the edge. Doing it, not so simple, after the thing is operational and you're up in the air, three or four stories. So uh, just the last thing I want just to talk about here is a flight of fantasy that I came across uh, when I first got to Dubai. And uh, it's a project that um, was out there as, a, as, a, um, as, a, as an RFP, which I responded to. And I won the job. Uh, it was massive, $1.3 billion worth of construction. And um, 
it's the best thing that never got built. I have to tell you, this is the uh, zero gravity building in the Dubai Financial District in the middle of a lot of other skyscrapers. It's two ovoids that um, were the brainchild of a, um, of a Singapore architect. Uh, and they, they won this design competition to create this wonder of the universe. It needs a full television screen. The entire facade is TV. So it, it, it's just interactive completely. Within this building, there are multiple buildings. So mixed use is, is, is within it, whether it's banking or, or whether it's residential or office or whatever it is. All exists within this. And the Sheikh loved it so much. Oh, I forgot to mention, when the guy designed it, it was that size, only that tall. Um, but when the, they won it, the Sheikh said, I like it so much, I want you to double the size. So make it twice as tall. Well, if you double the diameter of something, what do you do? You cube the volume, something like that? Yeah. Now, cubing the volume, isn't that a nasty thing when you start imagining parking and internal loads and people moving in and out and all this stuff. So the first thing we said we would do a feasibility study for a lot of money. And if you decide not to go ahead with it, you pay us for the study. If you go ahead, we'll take it off of our fee. They didn't go ahead. But we got paid. So, um, and I had, we had a lot of fun fooling around with this. I got to tell you, it was a gas. Because we had to deal with the structure, come up with the feasibility on that. We dealt with the TV thing. We dealt with the mechanical, electrical, and the infrastructure implications of that. It just wasn't going to fly. So there you go. So um, indirectly, I think that we've touched on many of the, the topics or the points that we had from before. There's lots of reasons why you do things. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. Uh, some of them are driven by folks who know what they're doing. And other ones, sometimes the better ones, are driven by folks who don't know what they're doing. Because when you really know what you're doing, you're restricting everybody to give you just exactly what your pro forma wants. And what fun is that? So, thanks for your attention, folks, and uh, any questions. Uh, only ask me questions that I can answer, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. Please ask oh. Chris. Sorry. Um, what kind of provisions are made for uh, replacing things like chillers and boilers and air hammers on 60, 70, 80 stories? Um, the phone number of the crane company who can get up that high. <laughs> I mean, it got up there in the first place, right? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> although I would have to say that, you know, taking a chiller apart is easy. You cut it apart and you throw it down in pieces. And maybe you don't go, go back up again with the same type of thing. You go back up again. That's more economical. So it is an issue, no doubt. Alrighty. The uh, Dubai and, and oil prices, is that affecting the business out there? Like is there a constriction of, of, of the construction that's going on there because oil prices are down so much? I would say that Dubai itself is less influenced by oil uh, than it is influenced by real estate markets. It was the um, it was the major short shorting of the U.S. market in 2000 and what, eight, nine, yeah. that finally had its ripple effect in 2010 that dropped the market out in Dubai. It was, it's not oil so much. There is some impact on that and some impact from the knock-on effect of having all your clients, which are, who are typically yeah, yeah. people from the surrounding countries yeah. that don't know where else to stash their money, right. uh, winding up in Dubai has that impact. All right, well, thank you very much.
All right, that was a definitely an interesting topic. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, that wraps it up for today. Uh, please check your emails tomorrow morning. You'll get a survey from the Ottawa Valley chapter. Definitely appreciate it. Take your time to fill it up. It gives us some great feedback, and it gives Chris some great feedback as well. So with that, thank you very much. Next month, last meeting. Hope to see you all there. With that, enjoy your evening. Thanks.